Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Have the same regard for one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be concerned for what is noble in the sight of all. If possible, on your part, live at peace with all. Beloved, do not look for revenge, but leave room for the wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Rather, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals upon his head. Do not be conquered by evil, but conquer evil with good. Praise be to God Peace be with you. And yes, yes, From the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Matthew, who proclaimed life to the world. Let us listen to the proclamation of life and salvation for our souls. Remain silent, listeners, for the Holy Gospel is about to be proclaimed to you. Listen and give glory and thanks to the Word of the Living God. The Lord Jesus says, when the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, He shall sit upon His glorious throne, and all the nations will be assembled before Him. And He will separate them one from another, as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep on His right and the goats on His left. Then the King will say to those on His right, Come, you blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. A stranger, and you welcomed me. Naked, and you clothed me. Ill, and you cared for me. In prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous shall answer him and say, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you ill or in prison and visit you? And the king will say to them in reply, Amen, I say to you, whatever you did for one of these least brothers of mine, you did for me. Then he shall say to those on his left, Depart from me, you accursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, 
and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. A stranger, and you did not give me welcome. Naked, and you gave me no clothing. Ill, and in prison, and you did not care for me. Then they shall answer and say, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or ill, or in prison, and not minister to your needs? And he will answer them, Amen, I say to you, what you did not do for one of these least ones, you did not do for me. And these shall go off to eternal punishment, but the righteous to life eternal. This is the truth, peace be with you. Bless 
Cursing is the wish of evil. That's the swearing through the wind, the windshield that the person who just cut you off at the stop sign. You know, you hope he's late for whatever he's going to. You hope he smashes into the next tree. That's a curse. We wish them evil. That's our natural human reaction. And we all understand it. So when St. Paul says that grace within our lives expresses itself by wishing well, blessing, those who do us harm, the word persecution literally means in Latin following after constantly. Persecution doesn't mean they just drag you out into the city square and cut off your head as a martyr. That's not, that's persecution, of course. But persecution, the word means to follow constantly afterward. That co-worker who nags me incessantly and grates me and knows that they're grating me, that is persecution. The person who is after me on my case, we would say these days, all the time, Bless him. Do not curse her in evil. It's hard. I'd rather poke her in the head. <laughs> smack her upside the face. That's what I feel like doing. But that's what St. Paul is saying, is grace is meant to be transforming us. And that's why in this epistle, like I said, use it for your prayer this week. Read it through one way, read it backward, look at it front ways, turn it over, look from the bottom, look from the top, reflect on it, think about it, what it means. And not just simply what it means for Romans 2,000 years ago, but what it means for the individual life that I have, how, I can tra how this should be translated. Because on one hand, it's very hard. And you have basically a breakdown of three. There's a beginning, a middle, end to this listing. The first part is about love, and let love be sincere. Love is not just affection. That's a feeling. It comes and goes. What St. Paul is talking about, love is an act of the will. I choose the good, and I will to do the good insofar as I can. That's what love is. Stopping and helping the old lady cross the street proverbially. That's an act of love. You may not know who this woman is. You may never see her again in your life. But it is an act of love because you desire something good and you do what good you can accomplish in that circumstance. But that's why he says love has to be without falsity. Because we do a lot of good things for the wrong reasons. To advance ourselves in the office. To look better in front of our enemies. We'll do things which will be good. And that's... The action is good, but the intention is for the false thing. It's for my vanity, my vainglory, my political gain, my social advancement, whatever. And so that's why he says it has to be without dissimulation. It has to be without falsity. And that's why he adds immediately, hating what is evil, truly objectively thinking correctly. Not only hating what is evil, he doesn't say dislike, he says we hate it. We reject evil, and then we cling to what is good. This is what we desire, is goodness, beauty, honor, nobility. And then the middle part of this letter, when he's saying that all of this is brought together, he says, if it be possible, and as much as is in you, as much as it depends upon you, be at peace with everyone. Wow, oh, this is difficult. But what he's saying is that there's always going to be misunderstandings. There will always be friction. There will always be arguments. There are arguments in families. There's arguments in between couples. That's just what happens. But how we argue is another thing. Do I actually listen in this disagreement so that we can advance beyond this conflict? Or do I just ignore the person, shut them down? Or just simply walk away? That's why in the last 40 years, half of our marriages all finish in divorce. We do not know how to argue. Because we do not know how to listen. And so when St. Paul, what he's saying here is, if it's, insofar as it's possible, be at peace with everyone. Notice what he's saying, insofar as it depends upon you. Everyone will have enemies. 
Everyone will have people who misunderstand them. But what he's saying is that our lives in clinging to the good must be such that insofar as I'm able to do something in this relationship, this friction is not because of my stupidity or my arrogance or my whatever. So insofar as it's to be attentive in our relations so that we'll be at peace with all. But it's also saying indirectly, don't be surprised, even God himself was crucified on Calvary. So that's the middle part. And then of course the end is, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil by good. And that's, that's also one of these ouch phrases. Because again, you poke me in the eye, I poke you back. You know, we, we quote this eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. It's, it floats around all around culturally. It's from the Old Testament. It's the law of Moses. And in itself, at the time of Moses, 3,500 years ago, that was an elevation of a sense of social fairness. Because in the pagan world, and to this day in many nations, it's vendetta. You destroy part of my field, I attack your cousin. You attack my cousin, I kill your brother. You kill my brother, now I kill your sister-in-law. And this thing goes back and forth and back and forth, and sometimes for generations. When I was in Fall River, there was a funny story that was told in the parish, one of the older men. And he talked about when he was a child back in the 30s and the 40s. Of course, that was the time of the Declaration of the Independence for Lebanon. Those were the years when it was establishing itself as an independent country. And he was talking about the generation of his parents, who were not immigrants, but who had been born in America already. But how there were fights in the neighborhood over things that were happening in the Middle East. And nothing to do with our neighborhood, but they're yelling and shouting and screaming at each other, as only Mediterraneans can do. And so, you know, he was just, it was a story which was magnificent, because of course it's carrying on the sense. So for Moses, the, eye, the idea for eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, was an elevation away from pagan vendetta. And it was not a, a perfect balance in justice. But our Lord then takes that mosaic principle and He raises it higher. Be perfect, as your Heavenly Father is perfect in the Sermon on the Mount. And He tells us what that means in the lines just before. He says, Your Father who makes the sun rise upon the just and the unjust, who makes the rain fall upon the, sea, the, the, the fields, of the good and upon sinners. You are meant to be the disposition to show goodness to all. Therefore, be perfect as your Heavenly Father is perfect. And that's why when someone does, I get poked in the eye, I want to poke back in the eye. But here St. Paul says not to be overcome by evil, not to wish evil for evil but to overcome evil by good. That's basically your three sections. The interior aspect, how we express our love, interiorly my intentions, how I act in such a way that hopefully being conscious and aware, self-knowledge of how I act, how I speak, and how I try to treat with others so that I can be at peace insofar as it's possible, depending upon me. And then finally, that when that misunderstanding and those bad things happen in our lives, do not render bad things for bad things, but to overcome them by good. This is all very hard. It's hard for me. It's hard for you. I know it's hard. And for 2,000 years, it's an echo through the churches, reminding us in each generation, isn't this a noble goal to pursue? But remember, the first part he's talked about was the transformation of grace within us. Not only is it a beautiful ideal, it is a possibility in my life to do. If we reflect upon it, if we play on it, and if our desire is there to collaborate with grace. 
But I'll leave you with the one last quotation in this epistle. Our Lord, when he's talking about humility and being good and loving, rendering good, choosing good, and doing the good that we can in the circumstances allowing us to do, he's not saying roll over and be beaten up. That's not humility. Humility just means I know who I am, I know where I'm at, and I know both my qualities and I know my defects. That's humility. Humility doesn't mean, oh, I'm a piece of dirt, please kick me around. That's not humility. Humility is self-knowledge. I know who I am. I know where I'm at. So that's the first thing. The second thing, you'll note that in this St. Paul quotes from, the, from the, the book of Proverbs, I give you the quotation references. It's not in the scripture. He doesn't refer to it being the book of Proverbs. But the quotation that he gives is from the book of Proverbs. And it's a kind of unusual one. And St. Paul it seems to be quoting from the Targum, the Aramaic translations of the Old Testament, and not from the Greek, we're talking about on Wednesday with the adults. And it says, if your enemy is hungry, give him something to eat. If your enemy is thirsty, give him something to drink. Take care of him. He's my enemy. Yeah. But quoting from Proverbs, he says, Give him food, give him drink. Because by doing so, you heap coals upon his head. Which is a funny phrase. You make him squirm. Now, St. John Chrysostom says these are the fires of purification for the other person to benefit in that. But the initial vision is that do good to them. Surely we've all had an experience where there's been an argument and you say something nice. And it just like cuts down the whole argument immediately. Because you've diffused it. It always takes at least two people for an argument. You, no one stands and shouts at the wall. Well, people do these days, and you see them sometimes in Central Park doing stuff like that. But that's a different problem. But not only in human interactions, it always takes at least two to get a good fight going. And when we do something nice, you diffuse it immediately. So hence Proverbs. Someone who's an adversary, who's in opposition to you at this moment, your enemy. Do good to them. Give them something to eat if he's hungry. Give them something to drink. Because you heat burning coals upon you. You make them squirm. They realize this doesn't make any sense. I have friends. Well, I have friends, but I have two friends who are married. They've been married for decades now. They're quite lovely together. But they told me when they first got married, for the first five years, all they did was rage at each other as they tried to find this adjustment of living with another person. Now, of course, they're telling me this story after 20 years of marriage. They've been married. So, so what happened? Obviously, something must have happened because you're still together. And this is a couple who at one point, well, that story for another one, never mind. This is, so I asked him, well, what happened during these first five years? And he said, it just, we were in one of our normal fights that fifth year. We just one of our normal arguments going on back and forth, slamming doors, whatever. And he said, I stopped. I just stopped. And I looked at her and I said, why are we doing this? And it immediately diffused everything at that point, and they began to listen. And in listening, they began to work out how they were going to live together as a couple, and hence, that 30 years later, now they're still married. But the initial comments, why are we doing this? That's Proverbs. Not reciprocating. So I leave you with all of it. Pray on it this week. It's a beautiful text. Read it in its context. Chapter 12, chapter 13, letter to the Romans. And then try to assimilate this material of St. Paul, this word of God, so that we each are able then to fulfill this direction. That to not be overcome by evil. And God knows there's evil all around us. But not to be overcome by it, but to be strengthened so that we may overcome evil by good. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
be my true and holy love. May we be bound by your divine love and find joy in all the days of our lives. Make us worry and forgive one another the greeting of peace with the holy kiss and fed through Jesus Christ our Lord. We may be your radiant and blameless flock. We glorify and honor you, your only Son, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Oh, yeah. 
Bring back those who have strayed that they may live in your fear and reward those who have brought offerings to your holy church. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, our civil leaders and all the children of your holy church. Grant them security and peace and keep domestic and foreign conflicts far from them so they may live in tranquility. Protect them by the sign of your living and victorious cross. Rescue the persecuted and displaced of your flock and be a refuge for strangers and companion to travelers. Grant your eternal reward to monks and to those who live solitary lives and to hermits who live on mountaintops and in caves of the earth. We pray to you, O Lord. send her vocations to the holy priesthood and religious life in a world of distractions which pull us away from properly loving you and our neighbor may those who you have called to serve your holy church respond to you and have the courage to follow your will we pray to you O lord, lord have mercy. remember O lord upon this altar your heavenly altar, the holy and ever virgin Mary, Mother of God, the prophets, apostles, martyrs, confessors, and evangelists, John the Baptist, the forerunner, Stephen, the archdeacon and first martyr, St. Joseph, St. Jude, St. Mary, St. Charbel, and all the saints, when you join in their ranks and share in their joyful feast, we pray to you, O Lord. especially Peter and Paul, Mark, Clement, Ignatius, Dionysus, Julius, and all those who endured suffering and persecution for the strengthening of your holy church. Remember those who serve your holy altar and forgive their sins, that they may reach your joyful dwellings. We pray to you, O Lord.
Eucharist and have perfected it in your good pleasure by the grace of your only Son and by the descent of your Holy Spirit. Sanctify us now that we may be renewed as your spiritual children so that with pure hearts and enlightened souls we may call upon you, O glorious Father and lover of all people, pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name.
worthy. Thank you for your grace. For you have given us this divine gift and have made us worthy to share in the body and blood of your only begotten Son, who saved us. Through him and with him, glory and honor are due to you and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Peace be with you. Jesus Christ, our Lord and God, you are worshipped and you are holy. Bless and forgive the priests who are the stewards of your people and of your holy church. Forgive the servers of your divine mysteries and all the faithful who have shared in this sacrifice. Care for orphans, help widows, assist the poor and the distressed, satisfy the hungry, and protect all who call your holy name in every place. May your name be glorified with that of your Father and your Holy Spirit, who is good, life-giving, and consubstantial with you, now and forever. Amen. So this coming week on Thursday, November 1st, is the Feast of All Saints. So it's a holy day, and so we're meant to observe it as we would a Sunday normally, so that includes a Mass. And so we'll have the Masses as usual with a Vigil Mass on Wednesday evening at 6 p.m., and on the day itself, Thursday at 9 a.m. Uh, for the Feast of All Saints. Go in peace, my beloved brothers and sisters, with the nourishment and blessings you have received from the forgiving altar of the Lord. May the blessing of the Most Holy Trinity accompany you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the one God, to whom be glory 